G'day guys, in this video I'm going to be showing you what logarithmic decrement is. And logarithmic decrement is really just an experimental way experimental way to determine to determine our dampening ratio zeta. So this is our dampening ratio. Now before I get into the definition of, of, of delta and before I get into the mathematics of how to actually derive the formula for um, logarithmic decrement, let me take a step back and let me tell you what underdamped motion is again because it's very crucial to have a good understanding of what underdamped motion is to understand logarithmic decrement. So let's go back to our standard spring mass dampener system. So we've got a spring, we've got a dampener, and it's connected to a mass. Now we've shown in a previous video that depending on our values of our spring constant and our dampening constant k and c, then our mass can, in, in some specific cases, can oscillate back and forth indefinitely with a ever decreasing amplitude. So just imagine this block just oscillating back and forth and gradually its amplitude approaches zero as time approaches infinity. Okay, And this is a case where we call underdamped motion. And as it turns out, from mathematics, we can tell that underdamped motion, under damped motion, i.e. when zeta is less than 1, that's what it means, under damped motion, then our equation of motion is given by x, which is the distance from equilibrium at some time t, is given by x, our initial amplitude, times by e to the minus omega n zeta t, times by sine omega d t plus phi. I've shown this in a previous video. This is our general equation of motion. Now let me bring your attention to this graph just here. This is something I plotted on Excel not too long ago. Basically, I've just drawn up one particular example of an underdamped motion case. The specific values aren't important, but the general shape of this curve is very important. Notice that it oscillates back and forth. It's a sine wave, essentially, but its amplitude decreases exponentially. And I use the word exponentially quite um, purposefully. I mean to say that if you were to connect all the dots of the, of the um, maximum displacements from equilibrium, then this curve, which I'm drawing this red dotted line, would be equal to an exponential. And this can be determined um, intuitively based off this graph, but you can also see this mathematically. Notice that the coefficient of this sine wave is in fact an exponential. So you can see that its amplitude will decay away as time approaches infinity. So this is a little bit of background information to under motion to really understand this. Okay, now I think we're ready to dive into the mathematics to derive the equation for um, logarithmic decrement. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to notice that at this first peak, we have a certain value. And I'm going to call that value x1. x1 is the displacement from equilibrium at this time. So it's x1 at what I will call t1. Okay? And just out of interest at this point, Let's also define x2 as being the distance from the second crest. It's going to be smaller because its amplitude is decreasing, and it happens at a time t2. Okay, so basically, intuitively get this. Your block's moving like this, and at its first peak, that's going to be x1, this distance, x1, and then at its second peak, it's going to be roughly here, and this will be x2, this distance, just here. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to define... I'm going to define delta as being the log, the natural logarithm of x1 divided by x2. So far, this is just a definition. It has, we've got, we've got no understanding what properties delta holds at this point. Let's just go along with this definition and see what we get. So if we were to plug x1 into this and x2 into this, what would we get? Well, in order to find x1, we actually need to go back to our equation of motion just here. Notice x1 will be a specific value of this when t is equal to t1. So we know x1 is going to be x, just some constant, um, times by e to the minus omega n, omega n is your natural frequency, times zeta, your dampening ratio, times by t1. Notice the subscript 1 here is important, times by sine omega d, your natural damped frequency, times by t plus phi. 
okay? Now, we can also notice, we can do the exact same thing for x2, just to say um, t, just replace t1 with t2, that shouldn't be an issue. Oh, this should be t1. That shouldn't be an issue. But I think you'll find it will be necessary to say, well, hold on, t2 can actually be written as t1 plus our period. And I'll, I'll, I'll denote our period as t subscript d because it's our damped period. This, this is our this is our damped curve just here, so it's got a damped period just here. Okay, so and, and notice that must be the case because we're from crest to crest. This is really important. This wouldn't be the case if this wasn't from crest to crest. This 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 distance just here, which I'm going to draw just here. This this time distance just here to here is t subscript d. Okay, so t two is going to be t one plus t subscript d. So let's write that down. We know that x x two x2 is going to be equal to that same x times e to the minus omega n times by t1 plus t subscript d, right? I'm, I'm writing the subscript d really to emphasize that this is for damped motion. And we're going to be timesing that by sine omega d, our natural damped frequency, times by t1 plus d by t subscript d plus phi. Okay, a little bit of a tongue twister. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug both of these values into here. There we go. So far, so good. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to notice that this bracket here can be expanded by timesing these into each of these individual components. And same for the sine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this thing after expanding these terms. There we go. So I've done that real quick. This, this step was pretty much trivial more than anything. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to realize that the denominator of this expression can be simplified even further. Notice that because we've got a minus sign just here, that we can rewrite this as two exponentials times by each other. So notice this is going to be um, this term times by e to the power of this term. So let me write that out for you right now. Let me just get rid of this and write this as a multiplication of e to the power of minus omega n zeta t subscript d. I hope you can read that. It's a little bit it's a little bit clumped, but I hope you can still read that. And I'm going to be going into simplifying the sign just here, but for now, let's notice that the amplitudes x cancels off. I should say x is your initial amplitude. Um, they cancel off quite nicely in the numerator denominator. And so do these terms. This cancels off and this cancels off quite nicely as well once we've separated it like this. Okay, so, so far we've got some interesting cancellation, but it's still not enough to make this thing pretty. So let's see if we can simplify this even more. The trick to simplifying this is to realize that this extra term we've just expanded out into, omega subscript d times t subscript d, can be turned into something else. Recall from a previous video, recall from a previous video that t subscript d is going to be equal to 2 pi divided by omega subscript d. We've proven this is true for any um, sine wave, right? Even a sine wave with a decaying amplitude, this is still true. Okay, so what we can do is we can arrange to get for omega, omega subscript d times by t subscript d by multiplying both sides. And we can say, well, t subscript d times by omega subscript d, our period times by our damp natural frequency, is equal to 2 pi. It's that simple. So let's erase this. Let's erase this and replace it with 2 pi. 2 pi just here. And let's talk about the consequences of such things. In fact, let me get rid of that bracket there. That should be just like that. OK, so let's see if we can simplify this out. Fortunately, we know that any sine wave which has a plus 2 pi on the end is just equal to that regular sine. Just type in sine 19 and then type in sine 19 plus 360 and you'll get the same answer, I promise you. Which means that this is identical to this, which means that they cancel off from numerator and denominator. Okay, which means that zeta, uh, sorry, zeta, that means delta is going to be equal to your natural logarithm of just this term, which is 1 divided by e to the power of minus omega n times by, I know it's small to read, but it's zeta times by t subscript d, okay? 
Fortunately, we know that any exponential to the power of a negative is just one over that. So we can write this as log of e to the power of positive omega n times by our dampening ratio times by our period, which is just this. Now, fortunately, logarithmic logarithms cancel out with this exponential quite nicely, uh, which means that you'll be left with omega n times by zeta times by t subscript d. Oops, forgot the subscript there. Okay, now we're almost ready to solve this completely. However, we're stuck with something. This is an omega subscript n, which is just your natural frequency. This is your natural frequency if there was no dampening. We have no idea what this is. We need to know some other information to find out what omega n is, which we don't have. So it seems like this is a dead end. But fortunately, we can substitute t subscript d out again and then replace it. So let's do that. We can subscript t subscript d with this. So we're left with omega n times by um, our dampening ratio times by 2 pi divided by omega subscript d. And you'll recall from a previous video, so recall from a previous video, I'll just write it here, that omega subscript d is equal to omega subscript n times by 1 minus zeta squared. This was actually a definition which came from a previous video. Okay, so if you don't understand where this comes from, please watch that video. And so we can rewrite this further saying, well, that's easy. That's just omega subscript n times by our dampening ratio times by 2 pi all divided by omega subscript n times by 1 minus zeta squared. Interesting. So even though we have no idea what omega n is, we know it cancels. So let's explore the consequences of this below. Let me just scroll down. There we go. I've scrolled down. So this means that delta, whatever we've defined delta to be, is just going to be equal to our dampening ratio times by 2 pi divided by the square root of 1 minus our dampening ratio squared. Right? Now we can end the video here. We've got everything in terms of our dampening ratio, but it's it's convenient to express things in terms of our of our dampening ratio rather than delta. I, I apologize if I said that the other way around earlier. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna arrange for this right here. And I'm gonna arrange by timesing this by that side. So let's do this. Let's go over here and that means that delta times by 1 minus zeta squared is going to be equal to 2 pi zeta and once you square both sides you're going to be left with this let's square both sides and what we're going to be left with is this in fact let me scroll down and zoom out a little bit there we go I've zoomed out a little bit which means that delta not delta squared that means delta is going to be equal to let's see what else Sorry, I meant to say delta squared times by 1 minus zeta squared, once the square root cancels out with the squared sign, is going to be equal to 4 pi squared times by zeta squared. Now it's in our interest to solve for zeta, so let's bring zeta to this side and see what we get. On the left hand side will just be delta squared, and on the right hand side you'll be left with zeta squared all times by 4 pi squared, um, let's see, it'll be plus delta squared. Right? And once you divide by both sides by this bracket, then you're left with our dampening ratio. Our dampening ratio squared is going to be equal to delta squared all divided by 4 pi squared plus delta squared. And once you square root both sides, you're left with your final amazing result that delta, your dampening ratio, is going to be equal to delta divided by the square root of 4 pi squared plus delta squared. This is an amazing result. And as it turns out, even though, and, and, and by the way, let me just bring this into a picture just here, delta was defined to be equal to the log of x1 divided by x2, where x1 is the height, the maximum displacement from equilibrium at its first time, and x2 is the maximum displacement at your second peak. Now, this is true for this definition, and even though I haven't shown this in this particular video, it also holds true for delta is equal to 1 divided by n times by the logarithm of x1 over x to the n plus 1. It also holds truth for this definition as well. I won't be going through the proof for this one, but it definitely holds true for this. Notice that this turns out to be just a special case of this when n equals 1. Okay, well, I hope that makes sense, guys. This is logarithmic decrement. It's something which is very useful for, term for determining the dampening ratio and hence also the dampening constant. Um, so it's, it's incredibly important for vibrations.
Anyway, I hope that makes sense. See ya.